these notes are about taxonomy, which is the study of classification. Now, you might wonder why it's necessary to have a system of labeling and naming things. But if you think about it for a minute, different organisms, plants, animals, whatever, have different common names in different places. And so in order for people in different parts of the country or different parts of the world to be able to talk about a particular species and know that they're talking about the same thing, it's necessary to have a unified system of classification. And so what we're going to do in, this, in these notes is to define taxonomy and talk about how, why it's important to have a standardized classification system. And then we'll talk about the categories that are used to classify things and that define the kingdoms of living things. So classification allows, a universal classification system allows scientists worldwide to communicate and know that they're talking about the same organisms. The system that we currently use was devised in the 1700s by a Swedish botanist named Carl Linnaeus. He came up with a system of classification based on a hierarchy of groups. In other words, you have a very large group that's divided into smaller groups, and each of the smaller groups is divided into even smaller groups all the way down. And what you end up with is that each um, individual species has a scientific name composed of two names, a genus name and a species name. This system is called binomial nomenclature, uh, a long Latinized word that means a two-name naming system. For example, you know that humans are known as Homo sapiens. Those are the genus and species names of our species. When you write a scientific name, it's important that you do it correctly. You need to underline or use italics for the genus and species name, and the genus name needs to be capitalized. So if you're writing it, you should underline the scientific name. If you are typing it, you should use italics. And remember that the genus name is capitalized, but not the species name. So Homo sapiens is written, as it shows here, one of the two correct ways that it's shown written here on the, uh, on the slide. Here's uh, the classification of a Bengal tiger, okay? This, the genus name is Panthera, and the species name is Tigris, and then there's a second tigress appended, that is the subspecies. There are several different subspecies of tigers, all belonging to the same genus. And then in parentheses, we see the name of the scientist who named that, and that was Linnaeus in this case. So we're going to look at, we'll look at this piece by piece. So the scientific name is Panthera tigris. If there is a subspecies, then you uh, specify subspecies after the, after the uh, scientific name. <clears throat> and then if you know the scientist who named it, the, you can put that in parentheses afterward. That would be the correct <clears throat> way to publish the name of, pen, of uh, the Bengal tiger. If you are doing a publication about a Bengal tiger, it's fine to list it the whole way the first time, and then afterwards you can abbreviate it as shown here on the screen. Here's the save space. Because if, you, if you've already talked about that species, then it should be known that that's the species that you're continuing to talk about in the same publication. Here's the, here, uh, this shows you the Linnaean system of classification, and it's in its seven categories. The seven categories are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And so we're going to follow this through step by step to see how you classify a grizzly bear. So we have several several animals here. We have a grizzly bear, black bear, giant panda, red fox, a bear, squirrel, coral snake, and a sea star. All of these things are animals. Okay. The next category under the kingdom is called a phylum. Members of a phylum are ones that have some characteristics in common, some specific general things in common. And so the phylum that most of these animals belong to is the phylum chordata. Phylum chordata members have a backbone and spinal cord. So this rules out the sea star. Sea stars do not have a backbone or spinal cord. They belong to a different phylum entirely. So we'll rule them out in this category. In, within the phylum, we have several different classes. Most of the classes are the different um, types of animals that you learned about earlier on, fish and amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals. So we're going we're gonna to go to class mammalia because most of the animals here, including the grizzly bear, are mammals. So that rules out the coral snake. Coral snake is a reptile. It's in class reptilia. So then we have the two, the three kinds of bears and the and the uh, fox and the squirrel. Within class mammalia, there are about 14 different orders. Okay, based on specific characteristics. Uh, so some of it has to do with the the shape of their teeth and what they eat and so forth. And so we have here the order Carnivora. These are carnivores. 
and that includes the grizzly bear, black bear, panda, and the red fox. Now, you may not think the panda is a carnivore, but it belongs to the order carnivora, whether it eats um, meat presently or not. <clears throat> then we're going to go down even further to the family Ursidae. Family Ursidae is the bears, and this includes both the grizzly bear and the black bear and the panda bear. To divide it even further, we'll get to the genus. The genus are ones that are very closely related to each other, <clears throat> but can be separate species. And so here we have the grizzly bear and the black bear. And then finally, down to the specific, the species, which is Ursus, Ursus arctos. So we've gone all the way from the kingdom, down through the phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Yes, you do need to know these seven categories. A, an eighth category has been added since Linnaeus's time. This is called the domain, and we're going to talk about what a domain is. And so the domain is the biggest. There are three domains, <coughs> six kingdoms, and a number of phylums, classes, and orders, and so forth. So for, for man, we have domain eukarya, which means we're eukaryotes. We belong to kingdom animalia because we are animals. We are in phylum chordata because we also have a backbone, a spinal cord. We're in class mammalia because we also have hair and other characteristics of mammals. Order is primates which means the primates, which includes apes and monkeys and, um, and humans, and a few other things as well. The family we belong to is hominidae, and our genus is homo or homo, and the species is sapiens, and so you give this scientific name as homo sapiens, which means wise man. Now, you have to know these um, categories, and you need to know which one's the biggest, the smallest, and so, so forth. And an easy way to remember things in an order like that is to have a phrase or a sentence that will help you. So here's one that can help you. Dumb King Philip came over for great steak. Now you can make up your own sentence if you want to. That's fine. Um, the one I learned in high school before we had domains was keep putting cookies out for Girl Scouts. Um, and so you can come up with your own sentence if you want to. But the big thing is to, is to know the D that it needs to be in this order. The D for uh, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order family, genus, and species. There are three domains of living things. Okay, two of them are strictly made of bacteria. The two um, domains of bacteria are archaea and bacteria. Now, in uh, up until the last 25 years or so, uh, archaea and bacteria were classified together in the one kingdom called Monera. And you will sometimes see um, in textbooks or other kinds of things, um, things referring to monera or monerans, and so you need to know that those two domains are included in that, um, and these are both kinds of bacteria. They are prokaryotes. And then the third domain is eukarya, and eukarya includes the protista, fungi, plants, and animals. So a little bit about each domain in particular. A domain archaea uh, are called uh, extremophiles. These are unicellular prokaryotic cells. They have no nucleus. There's one kingdom belonging to domain archaea. That kingdom is named archaebacteria. The DNA of these bacteria has both introns and exons. Now, what this means is um, every piece of DNA is not transcribed fully into, into or translated fully into a, a protein. There are parts of it that are edited out. The introns are the parts that are edited out, and then the exons are spliced together to make, the, um, to make to the part that needs to be transcribed. So the DNA of archaea bacteria, or archaea, have both introns and exons, which is very um, important. We'll see that in just a minute. Most of these live in very extreme environments, places where there's high salinity, high, high um, acid content or base content, high temperatures, just very kinds of extreme organisms, they are extreme um, environments. They were probably the first organisms to evolve, and some examples of these include methanogens, which are bacteria that produce methane gas, halophiles, which, which like very strong, high salt content, and so forth. These are not bacteria that you would come into contact with in your day-to-day -day life. The second domain is domain bacteria. There is also one kingdom in domain of bacteria. The kingdom is eubacteria. These are also prokaryotic. Um, these are your common everyday bacteria, the ones that you are used to coming in contact with. They, their DNA has no introns. It only has the exons. So every bit of their DNA is transcribed and translated into protein. Cell walls of the domain bacteria have peptidoglycan, which is a 
protein um, starch complex that is unique only is only found in uh, members of domain bacteria. An example of a eubacterium is Escherichia coli or E. coli. Domain eukarya, the, the third domain, all of the members of this domain have a nucleus. Most of the members are multicellular. Their DNA has both introns and exons, which means that we're probably more closely related to the archaebacteria. There are four kingdoms in this domain. Kingdom protista, which is mostly single-celled organisms, various other kinds of things as well. Kingdom plantae, which is the plants. Kingdom fungi, which is the fungi. And kingdom animalia, which is the animals. And we're going to talk about each one of these kingdoms in turn, so be sure to write down information about each one. Kingdom archaebacteria, um, once again, are prokaryotic. They have cell walls without peptidoglycan. They are either, either autotrophs or heterotrophs, one or the other. They often live in very extreme environments. They're also often called extremophiles. That means they like extreme uh, environments. Examples are methanogens and halophiles. Kingdom eubacteria, these are also prokaryotic, and they have cell walls with peptidoglycan. They can be either autotrophic or heterotrophic and is found in a variety of habitats. And examples are E. coli, Staph aureus, which is what caught Staphylococcus aureus, which is what causes staph infections, various streptococcus species, which is what causes strep throat, and so forth. These are the bacteria that you normally come in contact with, the ones that live in your environment, on your skin, in your body, and so forth. Kingdom protista is defined as being eukaryotes that cannot be classified as fungi, plants, or animals. This is a kingdom that is kind of a catch-all. It's where you put things that don't fit anywhere else. It probably will be subdivided. In fact, scientists are in the process of developing categories, sub subkingdoms or whatever for the different groups in protista. Most members of protista are unicellular, but some are multicellular. Some of them are autotrophs, some of them are heterotrophs. Some of them are both autotrophic and heterotrophic at various times. There's a huge variety of organisms in this kingdom. An example is amoeba, which is kind of like a blobbish kind of single-celled organism. Um, we'll talk more about these later on. Kingdom fungi is defined as being eukaryotes with incomplete cell walls made of chitin. All members of kingdom fungi are heterotrophs. They absorb nutrients that are digested outside their bodies by enzymes that they secrete. Most of them are multicellular, but there are some unicellular ones. And examples of kingdom fungi are mushrooms, molds, and yeast. Kingdom plantae are also eukaryotes. They are defined as being multicellular autotrophs with chloroplasts and cell walls made of cellulose. All members of kingdom plantae are non-motile. That means they can't move around from place to place. Yes, they can move, but they can't pick up and move from one place to another. All members of kingdom plantae are photosynthetic. Examples, trees, flowers, grass, any kind of plant that you normally come in contact with. And the final kingdom is kingdom animalia. Kingdom animalia are all eukaryotes. They are defined as being multicellular heterotrophs without cell walls or chloroplasts. They are the only kingdom with no members with cell walls. Every other kingdom has at least some of its members with cell walls. <coughs> Most members of kingdom animalia are motile in one way or the other. Um, examples include insects, worms, mammals, fish, birds, and so forth. This concludes the notes about taxonomy and classification. In class, we will learn how to um, use a dichotomous key to classify organisms as well as some other kinds of methods for um, determining classification.